This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. So, if you're ready, join us. Today, our journey is not far away and long ago, but right here and now. We have a very special guest, Bill Isla, or William Isla Jr., either one whichever. Is, either one is either fine, Marcia. I think of him as Bill. Uh, Bill is currently the Deputy Director of Hawaiian Homelands. That's correct. When, and so welcome to the show, Bill. And we are delighted to have you, especially had to run all the way from out in the country to be with us. I want to thank you, Marsha, for uh, <laughs> your patience. And also thank you for all the years of service to um, you know, environmental justice issues, civil rights issues in Hawaii. I mean, you you've, and we've been together on that path you, for a long time. <laughs> You, yeah. you have made life better in Hawaii for oh, everyone. aren't you so sweet. Um, Bill is, like he says, we've been friends for a long time. When he was out at the Boat Harbor? Yes, Hawaiian Boat Harbor. Hawaiian Boat Harbor, when he was in charge. And that's the job I always wanted. <laughs> Not that anybody would hire me, but that was the job I always wanted. And then you ran for... Governor. Yes, 2006. And the next job was? The uh, uh, Governor Abercrombie decided to um, appoint me for the uh, chairman of the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Now that's an interesting, Land and Natural Resources is the department, and then there's a commission within that. Yes, it's called the Board of Land and Natural Resources. So were you both? I was the chair of both. Of both. How does that work? The, um, uh, the statutory language that controls um, the agency sets up the Board of Land and Natural Resources as the um, authority, uh, the decision-making body. So as the chair of that decision-making body of seven members, uh, we created policy and, and made decisions on land dispositions and uh, you know, federal spending and things like that. Whatever the um, board decided to delegate to the chair of the agency, that would be me, um, was also my uh, responsibility for carrying out. Now that, that is the, probably the biggest department in the state of Hawaii in terms of reach and uh, areas of, of responsibility. I would think so, since the land is all of the state of Hawaii. How many islands are there? Um, well, eight main islands. I mean, other than the main islands. Well, there's, if you count all the little ones, it's, it's in the hundreds. And then if you count the county of Honolulu, it actually goes all the way up to Kure. Right. So, you know, more than 200 and, more than 2,500 linear miles. Miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, that's a big, a big department. It is, but it was a, it was a fun place to work because people, as with Hawaiian Homes, people in the department really cared about what they were doing um, and, and were committed to trying to make things better. Let me ask you a, a loaded question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How do you know all of the land, all of the valleys, the mountains, the rivers, the streams, how do you know all of that? How do you survey, or is there a record of all of that? I think in both institutions, the Department of Land and Natural Resources and in the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, you have a staff that has a wide array of institutional memory. So knowing of, of all the valleys and of all the lands is certainly something that um, you can have on maps, but the more important thing is to have people be able to tell you what the history of uh, the use of those areas are and what the um, special things are, are of those areas that we need to protect. So there's so many places that have the same name. Yes. On different islands with yes. the same name. And so Waimea Valley. Mm -hmm. If you say Waimea Valley, well, there's one of those on each island. On Kauai, on Oahu, and on Hawaii Island. Yes. So how, how, do, you, how do you know the difference? Well, you Is could... it 
is there a way to say to make a difference so they they've served different purposes they have different histories different mythologies all of the above, and in terms of you know um, trying to keep it straight for for government work, so to speak, you know you have that comma, and then you have the island behind <laughs> it, right? <laughs> but then, from a cultural perspective, you know if that's, you that's what I mean, if, cultural. if if you are aware of the differences, um, it's easy to uh, understand because each has its own set of mo'olelo and stories, and right. each has its own sort of geographic. Uh, differences about it. So, you know, Wa Waimea on Oahu, of course, is famous for um, the, the the priesthood retreating to uh, uh, Waimea Valley as the kapus were um, done away with. And oh, then, really? Yes, and then you have Waimea on Hawaii Island, and it's it's known for Parker Ranch and that part of Hawaii's history. Mm -hmm. And then Waimea on the island of Kauai is, is known currently, you know, for um, agriculture production, um, but in the past, um, having the, the beautiful mountainsides where um, sugar, sugar was planted and probably on Kauai, the most productive sugarcane lands. Speaking of Kauai, mm -hmm. and what, 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 what is left? What's left? What, on, what was damaged? What is left? What are, all of those sacred places, did we lose any of them? The assessments are just <coughs> just coming in now, um, so we're not to that level of detail. We do know that um, the flooding impacted uh, a lot of structures. Um, we haven't got to the point to you know determine like how what its impact is on you know um, endangered plants or endangered you know birds or things like that. That'll come after. The first thing is to make sure everybody's safe, mm -hmm. and then make sure that the mode of transportation. Um, is restored to the Haena area and the, and the valleys between uh, Hanalei and Haena. So that's that's going through. Uh, the department just uh, did a big clearing of uh, Ke Ko'o Bridge right. uh, above Anahola you know, to making sure that in, in case any rains should fall um, mm -hmm. from now on, yeah. that the uh, the bridge and the um, the drainage under the bridge um, is able to uh, be safe. So in these big like the Big Island and the volcano and the flood on Kauai. What is the department's position in all that? What What are you? Are you on the ground, or what? What is? What do you? What did um, the <coughs> natural so department? The, the Department of Land and Natural Resources yes. is certainly first on the ground because it has um, heavy equipment. Right. Usually attached to its forestry department or division mm -hmm. that's available for immediate, uh, you know life and limb saving, those kinds of things. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands, we don't have uh, a lot of heavy equipment, so we're more secondary um, places to, to place um, uh, green waste, things like that. Um, the uh, Department of Defense, of course, State Department of Defense takes over and utilizes each department's resources as it sees um, best, f best to address the immediate concern. Mm -hmm. Well, now, what is the difference in Hawaiian homes, Hawaiian homelands, what you're working with, and the Department of okay. Land and Natural Resources? So the Department so all of Hawaiian home, all of Hawaiian land, right? Well, the, it's all crown, crown, crown lands, land. generally. Mm -hmm. But uh, in 1921, uh, the U.S. Congress decided that, um, at the urging of Prince Kuhio and, and others, that uh, for the rehabilitation of the Hawaiian race, um, because of the, the rapid decline in population and the movement to urban areas, um, that the, the program of resettling Native Hawaiians back on the land was very, very important. So Congress um, set aside 200,000 acres of land for homesteading use. There are three types of homesteading leases. You have pastoral, you have um, agriculture, and you have residence. So, for example, in Kapolei, you see all of those um, really beautiful homes, those are residential. Um, then you see in the Big Island where we have a lot more land, um, you see p big, large pastoral lots where... What, what, excuse me, what's a pastoral <clears throat> lot? A pastoral lot is where um, basically people ranch. Oh. And they, they, you know, farm either cattle or sheep or, or goats for commercial purposes or for subsistence purposes. Oh. Then agriculture would be um, either for subsistence purposes or for commercial purposes. 
Now, with Hawaiian Homes, who is, who do you, or do you lease or sell? How does that work? Okay, so when Congress set the program up, <clears throat> it created a, a, what they call a Native Hawaiian qualification. So in order to receive uh, the first initial issuance of a lease, you have to be 50% Native Hawaiian. The department goes through a process and looks at historical records, birth certificates, census records, to make that determination. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're eligible, there's a long wait list, and people on the wait list get offered lots as they become available. Now, when you say offered a lot, is that for sale? Is it for lease? Is it, it is. At, what's, it's, it's leasehold. It's leasehold. And generally, it's a dollar per year for 99 years. Mm -hmm. Then there's a provision in the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act that allows you know that third or fourth generation family, um, as long as they have the Native Hawaiian qualifications, to apply to the commission, this is the um, Hawaiian Homes Commission now, for another 100 years. So within a family, you could have occupancy of a plot of land for up to 199 years. Oh, OK. So then you could build a house, you can you can build a house on ag, you can and, on ag farm. and pastoral, you can build a house and uh, do either subsistence or commercial farming or ranching. Um, and the whole idea behind that was for, um, in, in 1921, was to get people settled back on the land and to reestablish for Native Hawaiians that relationship between the land because the leadership at that time saw Native Hawaiians drifting away to the urban areas disease, um, short lifespan, they also saw the land being neglected, right? So they were so, um, uh, their vision was so strong about solving the two problems. So they created this, this homesteading program. Okay, we need to take a break. And when we come back, we're talking with my dear friend, and everybody knows I only talk to dear friends. <laughs> we're talking to Bill Isla, and he is formally with the Department of Land and Natural Resources and now with Hawaiian Homelands. That's correct. And so we'll be right back. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you then. Aloha, I'm Marcia, and we are back. We're talking with my dear friend, Bill Isla, who is Native Hawaiian, an environmentalist, a community activist, a Native Hawaiian culture practitioner. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned a lot from him. <laughs> and you were also crew on the Hokulea for a minute or two. Yes, short, short, trips, short trips around around the islands, not the long, uh, the long voyaging stuff. But can I add two more things? Sure. Uh, or maybe three more. I'm okay. A, I'm a father, a grandfather, and now a great grandfather. Oh, I. So that that, works. that makes all of those other things much more important now in terms of uh, well, doing what's I, right for the I future. Have, I have a great grandson. Uh, now, I remember this meeting that you went to in the Pacific and you were the only one that spoke all the languages of all of the participants. Um, I, well, I, most got, of the I got through it. We could understand most each other. Most of the other. languages. <laughs> yes. Most of the languages. And I thought that is so great to have somebody in that position that can communicate with these other people. And without you, what happens? 
for well, the small island nations? You know, what's really interesting is the, the climate change issue really has That's been... What has been driven by the, the small island nations because they have the most to lose. In fact, some of them have, have already, already lost yes. emergent land. So this brings into question many things like sovereignty. What happens to their sovereignty? What happens to their exclusive economic zone? And because we have you know, a, a past relationship with Pacific Islanders and islanders all over the world, um, I think we are, they're looking to us here in Hawaii to help spread that message and to help find solutions. And so that's, that's a wonderful thing about Hawaii being able to um, act as a place for Pacific Islanders and Islanders worldwide to come, which we had the World Conservation right. Congress here you yes. know, two years ago and created a lot of good relationships and a lot of dialogue. And for me, the personal, um, the personal success was all the scientists and, and all the cultural people went home to other parts of the world and began talking about this term this term called biocultural resources. Because they were, they were seen as either environmental resources or cultural resources. But in order for any culture to flourish, you have to have the biology mm -hmm. that's, that's part of the practices and part of the materials for the practices. So that was a personal win for me. Have we lost the cultural practices uh, with this influx of tourism, which, you know, it, it's a reality? Have we lost that? I wouldn't say we've lost it, but we have to be very careful that we don't um, um, commercialize it. So uh, the, the, the best example I can give you is uh, a, a young person, Kane or Wahine, doing hula. So if the, um, let's take the Wahine, for example, because I've seen it in many shows where they, they have traditional kahiko, Right. Hula, and then they have sort of modern hula, which is the you know the pretty girl dancing in the cellophane skirt with the coconut bra. Yeah. One is entertainment, one is culture, and we have to be very careful that we don't um, blend those two ideas. Uh, let's hope that day is gone. The tinsel skirts, money. Now, you are going. I saw an ad that you were going to run for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So, yes. tell me what that decision is about. That decision is really about, I think we, we Native Hawaiians and um, all of the people that live in Hawaii, are really at a, a turning point. You can feel the energy that you know, change is going to come and change, big change is going to come. So given the um, recent um, bad publicity for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs in terms of how monies have been spent and how they've been allocated. Uh, I, I felt that it was the right time to bring the skills you know, that I've acquired over uh, a number of years um, into the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to try to see if we can do a couple of things. One is to restore civility because we, uh. have, to, we have to be a good example for our children and our grandchildren, right? We can agree to disagree, but we can do it civilly. Um, it used to be that way and it needs to return to be that way. The second thing is to provide um, to the beneficiaries, as well as to everyone in Hawaii, the accountability for how uh, the Office of Wine Affairs is operated, and then making it, of course, as transparent as possible. There are some things that can't be transparent because you discuss them in executive session or they're part of a legal lawsuit, um, but as much as you can, uh, answer, you know, answer to the people of Hawaii, the people of OHA, um, what's going on. Now, in 1978, yes. after it was decided we're going to have Office of Hawaiian Affairs and everybody was running and everybody was excited about it, where is that excitement? Where is that energy that even though I'm not Hawaiian, everybody was enthused, everybody was a part of having that happen? What happened? Where did that energy, that excitement about this I think the entity. I think the energy is still there. Of course, um, as an agency grows, it becomes more bureaucratic. So we need to take a look at the, the bureaucracy and see how we can uh, be more efficient at getting the resources to, to the people. Um, the energy is certainly there if you take a look at um, immersion language programs, charter yes. schools, which OHA is a strong supporter of. Uh, protecting the rights of, of Native Hawaiians for cultural practices, 
gathering um, water rights since OHA has come into inception, you've basically had um, a re-recognition of, of um, Hawaiians uh, and the Department of Hawaiian Homelands rights to water um, as uh, an entity that has a, a slightly higher priority in the, uh, in the water code. So the implementation of, of the water code as it was written also in 1978 mm -hmm. um, so that there's a more fair sharing of uh, water resources in Hawaii and the protection of traditional and customary practices through the protection of the watershed and, and near shore resources. So it's still there. I think there's, um, Oha needs to do a better job of telling that story because yes. it has, um, it has had very many successes in the past. Of course, the world is much more complicated today, and as we, as we, um, you know, face future challenges with climate change and things like that, um, we're we're going to have to uh, adapt and and maybe change policies or or be quicker in um, communicating the the needs. Now, what is Madam Pele's sister on Kauai? Well, Madam Pele's sister, that's the most famous one, is Hiiaka. Okay. Now, Hiiaka <clears throat> and Madame Pele are trying to tell us something. Are they, they're trying to tell us that, that we have not been good stewards of this land. That, How do we... Can OHA lead, take a lead in a, we have to respect the land, we have to be, be good stewards, better stewards? How can we... Yes. How, how, well, I guess that's... No, I, I think I think OHA has in the past. No, I mean, but maybe communicate that because obviously we're not getting that. I, so how do you you're you are running for OHA, and if I asked you that as a candidate, what what's your answer? How do we reach people so they understand we have to do better? Okay, so we, Madam Pelly is really trying to tell us something. So in the generation that has grown up since the creation of OHA, I think you've, you've seen a huge increase in the recognition of, of doing things pono. Reflective of um, increases in funding for the protection of our watersheds, increasing in, of, of funding to protect traditional and customary practices. But OHA can't do it alone, right? So OHA is going to have to partner with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, the legislature, um, even with private foundations such as Kamehameha Schools, and you can see their their programs changing. Where there's a lot more emphasis on um, doing what's pono for the land and for the ocean. So it's it's going to be partnering with with all of the um, entities that are available, um, which will help us overcome the the well, issue of um, I have, improving. Okay. Another big question for you, since you're going to be on the ballot. What about the CONCON? How do you feel about Constitutional Convention? Is it yay or nay? Because it, on the ballot, it only gives you an option of yes, yes or no. no. How do you feel about I, that? I think, well, I'm, I'm sort of torn on it because I think it... it it provides opportunity, but it also provides danger. It does. Um, danger in um, reversing some of the protections of the 1978 Constitutional mm -hmm. Convention, which you know created the Water Code, which created right. um, the um, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and created protection for labor and protection for um, uh, a lot of things here in Hawaii. So the danger is if if there is one, um, that there'll be a push to roll back some of those protections and some of those improvements. I wonder if young people understand. Not having, not having gone through mm -hmm. those issues, I don't think they fully understand the consequences. Consequences, I if, guess that's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. If, um, you know, if depending on who gets elected and what are the documents that come out of um, a, a con con, uh, an impact on um, you know the average person's uh, life here in Hawaii, including yeah, well, Native since, Hawaiians. Since you are an environmentalist and a Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner, oh, that's a lot of words. It is. <laughs> so your being, your whole being, is to protect 
and care for the land. Yes. So in campaigning, do you mention the CONCON? You, personally. The CONCON, that is this yes or no, and if it's a yes, the dangers. I mean, do you go there I or not? I haven't to this point because the CONCON is uh, something that the the people of the state of Hawaii are, are going to have to um, choose on. Um, but I would, so the status quo, of course, is not perfect, but we're evolving to fix many of the problems. So I think personally I would answer it this way. I'm, I'm not in favor of a con, con right now because I think the um, environment, and I'm really concerned about the impacts on social media. I am too. Because there's not, uh, with, with social media, there's not a lot of time to fact check. Right, and when and you do somebody with money can, and and when yeah. you do fundamental change to the way that we govern, um, you need to take the time to uh, seriously consider the consequences, both positive and negative. Um, but if there is a con con, if you can't stop it, and the people of Hawaii decide that they want to do that, then we have to make sure we elect people, people. who who remember um, this this kuleana, this responsibility to protect, you know, native rights. Um, the environment, um, laborers, um, you know, hard work. I, I was a union member for 24 years, um, you know, so, uh, and it, it gave me the opportunity to, to raise a, a family and help my son go to school. And so there are lots of good things that are, that are in the current um, constitution of the state of Hawaii that we have to keep. I, I agree with you. And uh, now one last question, because we have a minute left. What does it mean to run at large? That is um, where you're running at large. What yes. does that mean? So it means that in this particular election cycle, there are three at-large candidates that are up for re-election. How many at-large candidates? Uh, four altogether. There's four altogether. And then there's okay. four that um, uh, represent each island. Uh -huh. Actually, I should say that. There's five altogether and four that represent the islands. But they're all voted upon statewide. Yeah. So in this particular election, um, in the primary, the top six will move to the general um, unless someone gets 51% of the vote in uh -huh. which that they would, you know, they would automatically be in. So, um, so I can vote for... You can vote for three, for three. at large. At large. Yes. Uh -huh. And then you'll be able to vote for the Oahu Island representative and the Maui Island representative. Oh. Statewide. Even though I don't live on Maui, is, I can that still... That is correct. That is how it was written in the election law. Right. Well, yeah. We need to take a look at that and see if it's still applicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, I do appreciate you rushing to get here, <laughs> flying over the traffic and whatnot. Safely. So, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure being mm -hmm. with you. You will come back and... Tell us more. Sure, Marsha. Anytime you want to know about anything, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Aloha. Aloha.